can't go. Uh, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, thank you. Oh, great. Fantastic. Can you see the board okay once it focuses? Uh, for the All most right. part, yeah. Go on, let it focus, let it focus. Is it going to get there? It's going to get there? Oh, right there. There we go. Cool. Got it. Thank you. All right. Um, that's going to be embarrassing for the video. <laughs> I'm gonna have to cut that out. All right, anyways, we have the discriminant. Um, B squared minus four AC. Um, we have our A, per, A term, B term, C term. Just plug in, right? Our A term is one, B term is negative three, C term is 12. So this is negative three squared minus four times one times 12. Negative three squared gives me nine. Minus four times 12 is gonna be what, 48? That's going to give me a negative number, right? Negative number means what? It's going to be false, right? This gives me, uh, what's that going to be, negative 39? So that means it's false because now, what do we get? Instead of two real solutions, we get two complex. That's our easy. All right, remember for the discriminant, if the discriminant is positive, let me just make sure it's here. If the discriminant is positive, we get two real. If the discriminant is zero, we get one real. If it's negative, we get two complex. And so basically all you have need to know for that, find the discriminant, is it positive, is it negative, is it zero? What do each of those tell me? Tell me that. Questions on? You're okay with that? I know we saw that. I was down the line. This one. All right. Well, um, we're right. If I'm going too fast at all, anyone should tell me. Slow down. Um, I've had 600 milligrams caffeine today for a little more, so um, we're cruising. All right. Y equals two over three x plus three is a linear function. When we graph two or three x plus three, what does it look like? It's a line, right? It's gonna look a little something like here's our little that. It's gonna look like a line. True. It's a line. And then you're good to go. True um, is a line. And then you can draw the little, little, little graph. Um, and I'm good. Can you just say it's like, it's a y, and it's yeah, you can say it's a form y equals mx plus b, which, yeah, um, that's good with me too. x plus 5, x minus 5. So two terms are then multiplied together. That's plus equal x squared minus 25. The true or false? Let's find out. Let's just foil it out. You can use the box if you want. You can foil, you can use little arrows to distribute. I don't care. Do whatever you want. I like the arrows, that's just me. X times X, X squared. Positive five X times X, plus five X. X times negative five, minus five X. Five times negative five, minus 25. Find like terms. 
these two terms gone. What am I left with? X squared minus 25. True. We okay on that one? That one's just making sure you know kind of how to multiply this out when you take uh, so good there. All right. All right. Still there? Yeah. All right. Um, I'll just leave that up. I don't want to erase it so it's just in case kind of writing in case. All right. Now we have f of x is equal to negative two times the quantity of x plus four squared minus four. And we're saying that's shifted up, right? Going to the right four and it's facing down. True or false? Why? All right, this x plus four, it's inside the parentheses, so we know it's going to be the opposite term. So we're really going left four, right? And it's going left four, and then we're really going down four. This is saying up four and right four completely. It is facing down though, so that's nice. Watch this. Isn't it also stretched too? It is. It is stretched. Yeah. Right? We have this who out in front it doesn't even mention anything about stretching out here. Um, so just all wrong. All wrong. Um, you can say false because um, it's stretched too. It's false because you're going left four. It's false because you're going down four. Um, it would be great if you could do all of those. If you want to put one for me, that's fine. I know y'all have uh, a different instructor. So obviously go off what she grades like. All right. I don't know why I can say that. To complete the square. For f of x is equal to x squared minus 7x plus 13, we add 49 to both sides. To know what term we need to add, right? We're going to add our little box to both sides. Mm -hmm. This little box. Negative b over 2a. Don't forget to square. Very important. We need to square that term. Again, going through, my b term is really negative 7. So now that's negative, negative 7. All over 2 times 1. Squared. Now that's 7 over 2 squared, which is then 49 all over 4. Does that match what we were given? We're saying we're supposed to add 49 to both sides. When I solved for this, I got 49 over 4. False, right? We're supposed to add 49 over 4, not just 49. All right. All right, find the little box, use that formula, find whatever that is. You're, you're, then you're supposed to add <laughs> that to both sides. Here, it left off that over two, and it just stuck with that negative seven squared, which gives you 49. So don't forget it over two way as well. It's not just that B term squared. So don't forget. Okay, all right, all right. Um, can I raise this? Are we good on that? Up. All right, now we have a set of ordered pairs represents a one-to-one -one function. How do we check that? Right, each input has to have a unique output. It cannot have the same output as another. Two different ways to do it. I like to go a little kind of table route. Actually, that's not how to do. Here's all my x's. Here's all my y's. And I write out. I know negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, and three. Negative three goes to what number? Goes to negative three. Negative two goes to what number? Negative two goes to negative one. Negative one goes to one. There's no zero. Don't know why I wrote zero. It's gone. One goes to five, right? Two goes to negative one. What does three go to? Does each x have a unique y? 
No, right? Negative three goes to negative three, but so does three. These two x's have the same y. So now it's not one to one. They each need their own y value. Since these two share one, it's not one to one. False. Is that okay? If two of your x's point to the same y, it's not one to one. Sound good? Of g of x is equal to f of x times e. Here, now we have a common solution of functions. When this, I, you probably can't see very well soon, uh, but hopefully you have it pulled up and off the side. When we have this little open dot f of g of x, that means it's composition of functions. So we can write it as f of g of x. Now we take g of x and we plug it into whatever that f function is. Is that the same as multiply? No, right? So that's actually not equal to false. Right. Um, the reason you would for that is, you know, if this is actually f of g of x, you're plugging it into the other function, you're not multiplying too much. Right? Very different from one plugging it in to multiplying two. So good. I really wish my classroom was this classroom. Like, this is so nice. Um, anyways. The inverse of f of x is equal to 3x minus 4 is really just g of x is equal to 1 over 3x plus 4. Um, this is just a reminder of how we solve the inverse. Take f of x, that's going to be, I'm going to rewrite it as y is equal to 3x minus 4. I'm just rewriting f of x as y. You can leave it as f of x, doesn't matter. Okay. Same thing. I'm going to take my y value, I'm going to take my x value, and I'm going to flip them. Once I do that, I now have x is equal to 3y minus 4. So in step one in finding that inverse, take those two variables and flip them. Right? Because the inverse means that all your x values are becoming your y's and all your y values are becoming your x's. Inputs become outputs, outputs become inputs. Hence that flip. Now we just solve for y. Right? You flip them, solve for y again. Get that by itself, that'll be your difference. So step one, I'm going to add four both sides. So now I have x is equal to 3y. Sorry, x plus 4 is equal to 3y. Now we have 3y. Getting y by itself, I see we're multiplying by 3. To get rid of that, if we're multiplying, we will divide. Five both sides by 3. We have y is then equal to x plus 4 all over 3. And that is our inverse. Does that match what we are given? No, we are given it's 1 over 3x plus 4. If this was written as 1 over 3x plus 4 over 3, would it be true? Yes. Yes, it would, right? We can write it like this, or we can write it as x over 3 plus 4 over 3. Right? But here, we're not given 4 over three, we're just given plus four, false. Does everyone see that, is that okay? Finding the inverse, take your x and y, flip them, solve for y again, and then just kind of be aware that x plus four all divided by three, you can split it into those two separate fractions. Just be aware of that. Um, sometimes and occasionally they'll switch it up on you a little bit, so kind of be aware of different ways you can finish these problems. Sound good on them? Questions, comments, concerns, feelings? No, cool. All right. We have negative four times y squared. That is n to the power of three. And we're saying that is really equal to negative four uh, times y to the fifth. Any ideas? Since it's going to be positive or negative, any feelings, any intuitions? Right. It's going to be false. How do we know that? So there's three. We have to be careful. When we have a quantity inside parentheses and we're raising that whole thing to a power, 
we have to distribute that to every term inside, right? Just how if we had four times x plus five, right? And you distribute distribute that to every term on the inside. Kind of same concept here. You're going to distribute it to every single term. So now this is going to be negative four cubed times y squared to the power of three. Negative four cubed is going to give me negative 64. And from there, we already know it's not going to be equal to negative 4y to the fifth. Let's just finish it out, right? So why we're here for a review, let's review everything, right? Y squared to the power of three. When we have an exponent to an exponent, a power to a power, what do we do to those numbers? Do we add them or do we multiply them? Multiply, right? Power to a power, multiply. Two times three, y to the sixth. That does not equal negative four y to the fifth. False. We'll see some other uh, exponent stuff later. Um, so we'll kind of see when you would then add the exponents instead of multiplying. Make sense? The function f of x is equal to negative four x plus seven. We're saying that's increasing. How do we know whether a function is increasing or decreasing? Right, yeah, we're looking at slope, right? If the slope is positive, right, you want to look at slope. If we have a positive slope, we're increasing. If we have a negative slope, we're decreasing. Do we have a positive or negative slope in negative 4x plus 7? Negative, which means we are decreasing, which tells me that this problem is false. We okay with that one? What are you doing? Yeah. All right. Next up. Question two. Which one perform the indicated operations? Now I got some practice stuff. We haven't gone over some practice stuff and talked quite a bit. Probably what first exam? Like first couple weeks. Not quarter, we're not on quarter, I've never been. Semester. We have three over four times four over seven. We are multiplying fractions. Do we care about common denominators? No, when we are multiplying or dividing, we do not care about common denominators. When we are multiplying, all we have to do, multiply straight across, right? So this is going to be equal three times four over four times Z. Three times four? 12, four times Z, four Z. And then we want to multiply, not multiply, simplify where we can. Here I see, I can kind of recognize that 12 divided by four, that's gonna give me three, right? So that's gonna be three over Z. You could also recognize, right, at the start, there's that factor of four on the bottom and in that other fraction on top, there's that other four. So you can kind of, Reduce those to one right away. If that makes sense to you, recognizing that those two numbers are the same, one has to be on the denominator, one has to be on the numerator for you to be able to do this. So if you see that, if that makes sense to you, do it. If not, just multiply straight across and reduce when you can. Um, try a true way. Try not to get too fancy with it. Next up, three over five plus five over nine. Well, now we're adding fractions. What do we need to add fractions? Common denominators. So now what I'm gonna do, is so I'm just gonna take the denominator of the second one and I'm just gonna multiply the top and bottom of that first fraction by the denominator of the second fraction. Right, so here it's five over nine, so I'm gonna multiply three over five by nine on the top of the bottom. Now I take this first fraction, take that denominator, multiply the entire second fraction by that first fraction, which is five. I'm gonna simplify both of these terms now. Three times nine gives me 27. Five times nine gives me 45. Five times five is 25. 
9 times 5 is 45. The reason we take one denominator and multiply the other fraction, kind of do that little switch vice versa sort of thing, is because now we have the same number on bottom of both fractions. Now we can add. For adding fractions, keep the denominator the same. Do not touch it. Don't do anything. As soon as you get that common denominator, add it, should we write it right there. And then you add the top. What's 27 plus 25? 52? Yeah, that sounds right. And from there, reduce when you can. Can you reduce it? I don't know. I don't think we can. So, if you can, great. I, I'll put my head. I can't think of it. So, questions on that one? Multiplying straight across, adding common denominators. Then add the top, leave the denominator alone. Um, for the sake of uh, everyone, please uh, box your answers. It just it helps all of us. Uh, so, <laughs> questions on this? Good. Three. Simplify the following completely. Answers will answers should be written with positive exponents when appropriate. So here now we're dealing with all these exponents, kind of rules and properties, and we want to make sure we want to write with positive exponents. Now part of that we have x squared to the power of three times x to the negative third power to the power of four. Power to a power. Exponent to an exponent. What do we do? Multiply the exponents. That's what I'm going to do first. X to the power of 2 to the power of 3. That's really X 2 times 3. There we give that. That's my first term. We are still multiplying this next term, which is X to the negative 3 plus 4 times 4. Okay. My adding 4 and multiplying by 4. Multiplying by 4. Why are we multiplying by 4? Power to a power. All right, x to the 2 times 3, what is that? x to the 6 times x to the 3 times, or negative 3 times 4 is negative 12. Now from here, there's two different ways to think about this. Way number one, we have common bases. We have those like bases, x on both. Now we're just multiplying these terms. Now we have common bases, we're multiplying the two terms. You should add those exponents. So you can have x to the 6 plus negative 12, and that's going to give you x to the negative 6. When you have that negative exponent, right, you either move it down or you move it up. Here, we're going to move it down. So now it's 1 over x to the 6. And that'll be our final answer. All right. When you have that negative exponent, if it's up top, it's in the numerator, so move it down. If it's in the denominator, you can move it back up. That is what we can do. No big deal. Second way to kind of go about this is right here. All right. You can kind of flip this, right? We have x to the 6. That would stay the same. But then we multiply this by 1 over x to the 12. All right. Now we kind of have fractions. We multiply it straight across. x to the 6 over x to the 12. But then now we're dividing two common bases with exponents, what would we do? Then you subtract four. You can write out one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And just cancel six out. Mm -hmm. We're left with six on the bottom. One over x to six. If you like visually, you can write out all those x's on the top and bottom. Once you're right here, Cancel all ones that match up. Whatever you're left with, you're left with. Either way, you're going to get the same thing. Um, so, all sorts of different ways to go about this. Make sense? Sound good? Cool. Or B. Now we have three times more x. One, we have two x to the power of 3 times 3x to the power of 2 all over x to the negative second power. 
Step one, I'm just going to focus on the numerator, right? I have 2x cubed multiplying 3x to negative 2 all over x to negative 2. I don't want to worry about this x to the negative 2 yet. I just want to focus up here. When we have 2x cubed times 3x to the negative 2, right, what we want to do, make sure, first off, those variables are the same. Both our x, we have that common base. We have that same base. We can do the operations that we need to. Now that we have that, we know we're multiplying. So 2 times 3, 6, right? Just keep those kind of constants, those coefficients up front. Let's multiply. 2 times 3, 6. x to the third power times x to the negative second power. So, right? We rewrite whatever that common base is, which is x. I know I have 3. What am I going to do with that negative 2? Am I going to add the negative 2 or am I going to multiply the negative 2? We're going to add it, right? It's not a power to a power. It's not an exponent base or another exponent. We're multiplying these two terms. Plus negative 2. Don't forget, we still have that x to the negative 2 on the bottom. Don't forget about that. I've seen a lot of times people like, oh, they focus on the top and then they forget about the bottom. And it's a whole other part of the problem that they just don't do. So, all right. Now we have 6x, 3 plus negative 2. That's just 1. x to the negative 2. What do we do when we have negative x? We move it up, right? So now we take this, move it on up. 6x times x squared. 6x times x squared. We have two x's and we're multiplying. What do we do with the exponents? We have them. Right? If there's no exponent written, it's just one. That exponent's one. So now we get 6x cubed. Right? Reminder, if there's no exponent written either to a number or to a variable, the exponent's one automatically. You don't have to prove it to me in any. So, are we okay on that one? All right. Four squared plus three divided by 10, divided by five minus seven in parentheses. This one, just checking, do you know PEMDAS? All right, starting with parentheses, I'm going to go right here. So I'll have 4 squared plus 3 divided by 10 divided by 5 minus 7. So now inside the parentheses, we restart M dot again. There's no exponents. Multiplication, division, left, right. There's no multiplication, but there is division. What's 10 divided by 5? Yep. Keep that inside the parentheses, 2 minus 7. Now, again, still just doing inside the parentheses, focusing on that, right? We need to get that first. We now have 4 squared plus 3 divided by what's uh, 2 minus 7? Negative 5. All right. Now, those, that parentheses, all those operations inside the parentheses is gone. I'm only writing this inside the parentheses to make sure I have that negative sign attached to the 5. I like to kind of stay organized like that, or else I get lost in that negative. It's just someone floating out in space. And you forget about it. Now we have 4 squared plus 3 divided by negative 5. So we did all the parentheses work. Next, E, exponents. We have 4 squared. That's going to be 16 plus 3 divided by negative 5. Next, after exponents, because there's not left, multiplication, division, left to right. We don't have multiplication, but we do have division. 3 divided by 5, right? So that's going to give me 16 plus, actually, we could write that differently. But it's going to be plus negative 3 over 5, right? Dividing negative 3 and 5, you can't simplify that. You literally are just going negative 3 over 5. We okay with that one. And now 16 plus negative 3 over 5. Well, now we need to help now. So that's been fun. All right, I'm going to write 16 as 16 over 1, and we're going to be subtracting 3 over 5. All right, plus a negative, right, plus negative 3 over 5, the same thing's writing minus 3 over 5. Now we need common denominators. Luckily, when we just have a constant, right, we put it over 1, all we have to do, just multiply by whatever that denominator is. We can multiply this one by one and kind of do that, you know, vice versa sort of thing. Multiplying by one is not going to do a thing for us. 
H is an A. Give us the same thing. All right. So 16 times 5 is going to give me what? 80? So now we have 80 over 5 minus 3 over 5. Adding and subtracting factors, we need those common denominators. The denominator, when we do the operation, does not change. We just rewrite what we have. And then we perform whatever the operation is on top. 80 minus 3 will give me 77. That's our final answer. For these, make sure it is simplified totally as much as you possibly can. 77 is not divisible by 5. You can't go any further. So you can break it down into the uh, factors if you want. Factors of 77 are what, 11 and 7? And then the bottom the factor is 1 and 5. Those are all prime numbers here. You're done. Sound good? Make sense? Okay. All right. We keep it rolling. Sometimes it's six forty. All right. Now we have a line containing the points negative two, four, and one, comma three. We want to find the equation of the line, and we want to write it in both point slope form and slope intercept. Slope intercept form. It's y equals mx plus b. Point slope form is y minus y1, so then you get to m, x minus x1. A lot of the time when you're given two points, or if you're given the slope and a point, well, I mean, you're going to use point slope form. And then you use point slope form to then trans translate it or convert it into slope intercept. Step one, though, we have two points. What we need to do is find the slope. Find the slope, we use the equation, m is then equal to y2 minus y1 is equal to x2 minus x1. Does it matter which point I label x1, y1, and x2, y2? No, it does not matter. Typically, I do the first point x1, y1, and the second point x2, y2. To me, it just makes logical sense. If you don't like numbers and you want to flip it, sure, why not? But make sure it's consistent though. X1, Y1 for the same point. X2, Y2 for the same point, right? Don't have X1 and Y2 in one point if that's going to throw it off. That's going to be wrong. That would be that. Now, just substituting in. My Y2 value is 3, so that's 3 minus. My Y1 value is 4. X2 is 1. X1 is negative 1. 3 minus 4, negative 1. Sorry, that's negative 2, not negative 1. 1 minus negative 2, that really is 1 plus 2, 2 negatives make it positive. 1 plus 2 gives me 3. Negative 1 third is my slope. All right, use this slope formula, formula, to find it. Everyone okay on that? Now, we are then going to use point slope form to get slope intercept. Point slope form is y minus y1 is then equal to m, x minus x1. I've already labeled what x1 and y1 are. I know I have to substitute it in here. You can use either of these points, but if I already have that labeled x1 and y1, why confuse myself? That's already x1, y1. I'm just going to use those. I'm going to make it easy on myself. So now I have y minus my y1 is 4. So then equal to what's my slope? Well, we just found that. It's negative 1, 3, x minus. What's my x1? Negative 2. This is one of your answers. That is your point slope form. Typically, on like quizzes and exams, it's not going to ask you for like both on scene problem. It might ask you for like one on, or like point slope form on one problem, slope intercept on another problem. Um, I did it this way just so that way we can cover both and y'all know. Make sense. Now from here, we need to convert this to y equals mx plus b. So I'm going to do y minus 4. I need to distribute this 1 third out. That's going to be negative 1 over 3 times x. Then that's negative 1 over 3 ne minus negative 2. That's really just x plus 2. So then that's going to be minus 1 over 3 times 2. 
y minus 4, negative 1 over 3x, minus 2 over 3. Get y by itself in that 4. Right. Add 4 on both sides. y is then equal to negative 1 over 3x, minus 2 over 3, plus 4. Are we done there? No, we have like terms that we can combine. We have negative two over three plus four. It's a fraction, common denominators. Like negative four, just throw that over one. I'm gonna multiply both sides by there. So now I have y is then equal to negative one over three x minus two over three plus 12 over three. Now we have a common denominator. Let's combine those fractions, add those fractions. We then get y is equal to negative 1 over 3x, negative 2 plus 12 gives me positive 10 over 3. All right, that denominator doesn't change. We do whatever operations on top. Negative 2 plus 12, positive 10. Negative 1 over 3x plus 10. This is slope intercept. Why right, is it called slope intercept? Well, here's my m, that's my slope. 10 over 3, that's my y intercept, slope intercept in the name. Questions, comments, concern? Good there, good there. Cool. All Where did you get four? All right. Step one, find the slope of y equals three x minus two. So this goes back. What form is this in? Slope in step four, right? What's my slope? It's three. The slope is just that number. It's three. M is equal to three. You can also write it. The slope is typically right over run. You can also put three. Right, no difference. Find a parallel line to y equals 3x minus 2 that contains 0 0.02. Now we need lines that are parallel. Parallel lines of what slope? They have the same slope, right? So if our slope up here is 3 and we need the parallel line to that line, what's our slope going to be? Three parallel lines, slope same. Y equals three. So now I have a slope, and it gives me the point zero two. Right. Now we just need to find a line parallel to that. Y minus y one. Then you get the m. X minus x. All right. We're given the slope. We're given the point. Point slope form. That's how we'll do that. So now just plug in the point that we have. Y minus two, sending it to M, X minus zero. Sorry, M here is three. You can substitute that in, okay. Distribute that out, Y minus two is then equal to three X. What's three times zero? Zero, you can write plus zero. I'm just gonna leave it off, you don't need it. Get Y by itself, add two to both sides. Y is then equal to three X plus two. And that is your question. Questions on that? Is this just this that is the opposite? Uh, yeah, that's just coincidence. It's not always going to be like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just coincidence, right? We have 3x minus 2 and we get 3x plus 2. That's just all in case uh, from the numbers I picked. That's what we got. Uh, no specific meaning behind it at all. Now we want the line perpendicular to y equals 3x minus 2. So up here we knew if it's a parallel line, we need the same slope. If it's a perpendicular line, we need the opposite reciprocal slope. What I mean by that, so now our slope down here is the opposite reciprocal. So up here is positive. What's opposite of positive? Negative. So now it's going to be negative. Reciprocal, right? Let's flip it. Negative one third. That is our new slope. Right. If we were starting up here, 
and our slope was negative one third, we would end up getting three if it was perfect, right? Kind of go back and forth. Um, now we're given another point. We have our slope. What equation are we going to use? Point slope form, right? You have a point, you have a slope, point slope form, done. So now we have y minus y1, so then equal to m, x minus x1. And then plug in what you got, y minus zero, then equal to negative one third, x minus two, y minus zero, that's just y, distributing this negative one third out, we get negative one third x plus two thirds. And then we're done. We don't have to simplify anything else. We don't have to add anything on from the left side with y because it was zero, it goes away. We're done there. Box that moving right along. Any questions there? All right, part D, we need to graph all three of those lines. Yeah, all right. Uh, can you read me all three of those lines? It was what? 3x minus 2? Y equals 3x plus 2? All right, let's grab these. I'm going to start with the top one. All right, all of these are in slope intercept form, which is nice. So then all we have to do, start with the intercept. This is negative two. That's the y-intercept. So now we're starting at zero, negative two. And our slope is three. Up three over one. Up three over one. One, two, three. Over one. That's not a point. Thank those, done. Um, depending on the exam or the instructor, you need more than just two points for the line. Um, you may need three, you may need four, you may need five, depends on the problem, depends on the training, depends on the instructor. Um, so be on the lookout for all those instructions and details and all that good stuff. Makes sense. I'd like three, at least. Um, that way I know, like, you kind of never go up there and you can also go down. Um, it'd be nice to see that, yeah. Does that make sense? Is that all right? Um, unless the instructions may say clearly show like three points or five points, like I think it did on exam four, it said clearly like mark five points. Honestly, you said that, get the five points. That's one, I'll label this one. This is going to be two. This will be three. Two, we're starting at zero, two. That's my intercept. Up three over one. I'm actually going to go down one, two, three. So the left one, and that's going to be mine too. Right, those look parallel. If I can draw a straight line, parallel meaning they don't intersect. Are those lines ever going to intersect? No, right. There's. So let's keep going over and over and over. Never problem. Now for equation three, we're starting at two thirds. Your best guess. Um, it should be better numbers, but two thirds, positive two thirds, that's nah, gonna be like right around there, give or take. That's my first point. Now it's negative one third, right? So now we can go up one, left three, or down one, right three, right? You're either, it's gonna be positive, negative, kind of one direction, right? So if you go up, you go left, if you go down, you go right. Make sure it's switch, right? I'm gonna go, let's see, uh, I'm gonna go down one to the right three. Down one, one, two, three, right? Here. And it should look like that line makes right angles with those other two lines, right? It should look like crossing right here, that should form a right angle, and that should form a right angle, right? Perpendicular forms 90 degree. Question on the lab, um, let's go so be careful, stay organized with those, kind of get, kind of like try to do everything at once. One line at a time, label them, mark them, um, make sure you have your points clearly labeled just to make you clean. So, all right. Question six, solve the system of equations. 
Sometimes system of equations will be set up perfectly for you to go and solve using one method. Other times you gotta kind of do some uh, rearranging. This is one of the times where it's already set up for us to use substitution, right? I'm not gonna lie, substitution is not my favorite. I like elimination, that's just me. Um, remember we have substitution, we have elimination, and we also have graphing. Most people don't like graphing, but it is a possibility, so just be prepared for that. If it is graphing, solve that, right? Just graph the two lines and see what that intersection point is. That intersection point is what the solution to that system of equations, right? That's all we're trying to do when we solve systems of equations. Right? We have two lines, they're gonna cross, right? We would be looking for that intersection. That's all. But here, we're given that y is equal to negative two x plus five. So all we have to do, just substitute it, right? Four x minus four, when we know y is negative two x plus five, that equals 10, right? It's set up perfectly for substitution threads, which is always nice. Um, then from there, just double check, you have the same variable now, you don't have any other different variables inside your equation. We have an x, we have an x. We'll get to solve for x, right? They have an x and the y still messed up somewhere. You have to substitute something. 4x minus four times negative two x plus five. Two ways you can write this. One, you can just keep this minus and then solve through. I like to write this as plus negative four <laughs> times negative two x plus five equal to 10. And just kind of carry that negative with you as you go through. Um, to me, that just makes more sense. You don't have to do that plus the negative. Four x plus now distributing this in. What's negative four times negative two x? That's eight x. What's negative four times positive five? Minus 20 to go to You can also just kind of know that this negative is going to carry with this four and go negative four times negative two and get positive. You can also just keep it right there and go minus negative eight X minus positive 20. You only get the same thing. Uh, however your brain works, however you kind of prefer to solve that out, again, do whatever you want. Combine that terms, what's four X plus eight X? 12x minus 20 is equal to 10. Get an x by itself, I add 20 to both sides. We get 12x is equal to 30. Get an x by itself, divided by 12, x is really equal to 30 over 12. Can we reduce that? Yes. Ah. Six. six. Right, there's a factor of six and 30, there's a factor of six and 12. If you don't see that right away, you can recognize 30 is a even number, 12 is an even number, so it's divided by two. They're both even numbers, just take two out to start, and you can keep going that way. It does take a couple more steps, right? Because we don't have to take out six at the end of the day, but as long as you're getting there, slow and steady is this. All right, so I'm gonna divide top and bottom, basically by six. 30 divided by six will give me five. 12 divided by six will give me two. So we know that x is equal to 5 over 2. Now that we have one variable, what can we do? Let's plug it in, right? Does not matter which one to plug it into. Just make sure you're plugging it into the right variable. This one already set up for y is equal to some number. That way I don't have to do more work. I'm just plugging it into the first one. Right? So then y is then equal to negative 2 times 5 over 2 plus 5. Negative two times five over two, that's gonna give me what? Uh, negative five. Negative five. Negative five plus five, zero. So y is equal to zero, x is equal to five over two. And we're done. If you want to double check your answer, if you either feel unsure about it, if you have extra time at the end of your exam, Take these two points, plug them in, and make sure that it makes both of these equations true. Right? You can plug in what you have for x, make sure you plug in half for y, sum them, make sure both sides equal each other to make sure you have the right. So good. So, all right.
I think we're on a meeting pipe. Crazy. All right. Oh, God. Number seven, we have a moose population has been growing linearly in 2000 population plus 2100 moose. By 2007, the moose population was 3,200. Assume that this trend continues. Part A, create a model for the moose population. When it says create a model, what we are trying to do is just write the equation, right? Write the y equals mx plus b, write that linear model. Well, how do we do that? Well, technically, we are given two points in this original problem, right? We're given that in 2000. The population is 2100. And then in 2007, my population is 3200. So we have two points. How do we find the slope? Y2 minus Y1, X2 over X. Again, it does not matter which one you label. You don't need to think. 3200 minus 2100 over 2007 minus 2000. That's going to give you 1100 over 7. Decimal. That's fine. Uh, we're going to leave it as a fraction. All right. Interpreting this in back into the context of our equation, what does this mean? This means that pretty much every seven years, the population is going up by 100, 1,100. Oops. All right. Seven years, 1,100. Oops. Dollars. If you divide it, it was, well, 100 and 157.4. Round up 158. It should hopefully be a better number. Roughly 158 moose per year is what the population is increasing by. Um, all right, so that is our M. So now we want to just find the, the right the actual line. Y minus Y1 is then equal to M, X minus X, right? You still have that second part. All right, I'm just gonna kind of use this area running out of green and then create enough for you so y minus y1 is equal to m x minus x1 i know what my m is y minus my y1 i'm going to use 2100 it's equal to 1100 over 7 times x minus 2000. this is where it'll probably ask you to Write it in slope intercept form or write it in point slope form. If it asks you to write it in point slope form, we are done here. If it asks you for slope intercept form, you gotta solve that out. Or the y intercept is also another way to say our initial starting point. In this problem, what is our initial starting point or what is our initial population? 2100. So we can kind of bypass this. And go y is equal to 1100 over 7 x plus that original population, which was 2100. And that will be our y intercept. So if, you, if that makes sense to you, right, the y intercept is really that starting point. Our starting population is 2100, so that would be our y intercept. And then just plug in yourself. Or you can do, do y minus y1 is equal to m x minus x1. And then simplify and convert to solve your subject. You'll get the same thing people. Hmm? It might ask specifically for point so four or solving um, This is slope intercept, this is point slope. Depending on what it asks, it may want more than the other. Just read the directions. Questions on that one? Word problems are everyone's favorite, so I'll figure that down there. Sound good? Cool.
All right, number eight. We have to use this graph for the following question. All right. All right, we want to find f of zero. When it says f of zero, are we finding when x equals zero or are we finding y equals zero? Oh, it's part B. All right, all done, all done. We want to use our model from part A to identify which year the population will reach 75. All right, that's on you. Our equation here was y is equal to 1100 over 7x plus 2100. I'm just going to use this one. We want to know when our population will reach 7500. In this case, it's our Y population or it's our X population. Y is going to be our population, right? So we know that here, that's going to be 7,500 is equal to 1,100 over 7X plus 21. And now we need to solve it. So you can find Step one, subtract 2,100 to both sides. That cancels out. We now have 7,500 minus 2,100 will give me 5,400. So we have 5,400 is equal to 1,100 over 7 times x. Trying to get x by itself, step one, what I want to do is I'm going to multiply by 7. I'm going to multiply by that denominator. So I'm going to multiply 7 to both sides. That cancels that out. 7 times 5,400 will give me... Thirty-four years Hold on, what's fifty-four hundred times seven? Thirty-seven thousand. Thirty-seven thousand eight hundred. All right. Anything. It's still equal to eleven hundred x. Get x by itself. Multiply by eleven hundred. Opposite operation. Divide. Gone. Eleven hundred. X. 37,800 divided by 1,100, you said, was approximately yeah. about 34 years. 34, okay, so about 34 years, sure. Do we give your answer as 34 years? No, don't leave it there. We have to put it back into the context of the problem. That's why everyone loves word problems, because you always have to put it back into what is this actually saying? Our initial year was what, 2000? So now 34 years after 2000 is when our population will reach that. So 2000 plus 34. So in 2034, the moose population will reach 7,500. Write that in a sentence. In 2034, the moose population will reach Oh, gosh, well, it's 75. Square that sentence. Beyond the image. Yeah, what? It'll be a little number. Yeah, it'll be fine. No. No, you're not allowed to calculate it. It's still the same as normal. No calculators. All right, we're going to um, right, moving on. We got, now we have a graph. We want to use this graph for the following. We want to find f of zero for this graph. Finding f of zero. Are we finding when x equals zero or y equals zero? When x equals zero. All right, when we write equations, all right, we can write it as f of x is equal to, say, like 2x plus 3, right? So that way, when we're given a number inside of that, as we did right here, that's when x equals 0. All right, so now we're just trying to find f of 0. Where it is? When x equals 0, where's our y value? 2. So f of 0 is equal to 2. All right, go to x equals zero. Where are we at? We're right there. Y equals two. So f of zero equals two. Now we want to solve f of x is equal to four. So now our y is equal to four, right? Now we're trying to solve for x. 
at what point for x or what value of x does y equal 4? So let's go to y equals 4. It's at that point right there. Uh, go down. That's x equals 4. That's that answer. All right? So depending on here. Okay. This is saying y is equal to 4. We're trying to find the x value of y equals 4. Does that make sense to everyone here, though? Okay. First, see, state the domain of the function. Is domain x values or y values? X values. Okay. Domain is x values. What is my smallest x value? All right. This is where my graph starts. You want to go left to right? Go on left. There's no points, no points, no points. We start right here. x equals 0. That is my smallest point. We want interval notation. Is this zero going to have a bracket or parenthesis? Right, why? Right. right, because this is a closed dot, this is a closed point, that means that zero is included in our domain. If it was an open dot, we have parenthesis. And then you put a little comma. What is my largest x value? Infinity, right? If we look at a graph, we're going left to right. We keep going. That just keeps going over, over, more, 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 more. Doesn't stop. When it doesn't stop, it goes to infinity. So we need to say our x values are going to infinity. Does infinity have bracket or parentheses? Always parentheses. Positive or negative infinity will always have parentheses. Pretty much it. That's all I got on that. Can't elaborate. Now, our range, we said domain was x values, so what was. What's my range going to be? The y values. Again, now we want to start bottom going up. Going up, what's my smallest y values? Two. I write that. Is that going to have bracket or parenthesis? Bracket. Close point, it's included. And then we're going up, going up, 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 up. What is the largest y value? Positive. Right, even though it's a slow incline, it'll still be increasing over and over and over. And over right, it's never going to stop slowly going down. So that means it's going to positive infinity, parenthesis, interval notation, infinity, have parenthesis, attached to it, open dot, parenthesis, close dot, bracket. We're good on that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's all for the rate, right? There's more than that one. Okay. Any questions on that? Oh, up here? That's just an example. Don't worry about that. Um, you want, if you want to know the actual function that this is, it's uh, the square root of x plus 2. Don't worry about that right now. So. Go down. All right, number nine. All right, so A through X. Uh, we have F of X equal to A to 3X plus 4. G of X is equal to X squared plus 4. X plus 1. We want to evaluate the following to make sure our answers are simplified and we combine all like terms. Okay. F of negative 3. We know we're looking at the F function. All we have to do is plug in negative 3. So f of negative 3 is equal to negative 3 times negative 3 plus 4. Negative 9 plus 4, negative 5. Done. That one's nice. Not bad. g of negative 3. Now we're looking at the g function. Plug in negative 3. g of negative 3 is equal to negative 3 squared plus 4 times negative 3 plus 1. Negative 3 squared, 9. Minus 12, 4 times negative 3 gives me 12, plus 1. 9 minus 12 is negative 3, plus 1, negative 2. It's positive 9. 
So then it's 13. There you go. See how easy it is? Did I mess up signs down there too? No, that should be fine. Okay, all right, all right, all right. All right, see what happens when you try to go to the back. You just mess up. All right, F plus G of negative three. So now, two different ways to get it. You can either just, we already found F of negative three, G of negative three, you can just add these two, or you can add F of X plus G of X to get F plus G of X, and then plug in negative three from there. Which way do y'all want to do? So you just add it with these two. If it's f plus g of, f of negative three, well, we have f of negative three. Right, let's test it out. Let's see, let's see what happens. Let's do f, right? So then you have 13 plus negative two. So we're saying that then f plus g of negative three is equal to 11. But now let's do negative three x plus four, plus x squared plus four x plus one. Combine like terms from there, we get x squared, negative three x plus four x, then plus x, four plus one gives me five. Well, I get negative three from there, squared plus negative three plus five, that's nine minus three plus five, six plus five gives me nine. Yeah, that cool. Okay, let me explain what happens to that. Step one, right? One way, f plus g of negative three. Well, we know we found f of negative three. We found g of negative three, so we just do f of negative three plus g of negative three, and we'll get a limit. Or you can do f of x plus g of x, simplify that, you get x squared plus x plus five, plug in negative three to that, and you still get a limit. Two different ways to go about it. Sometimes it'll have it set up nicely to where you can kind of just, if you know this, great. If not, add the two functions, add f of x plus g of x, simplify, plug in. Two different ways, get the same answer, good job. f minus g, negative three. I'm gonna go the long way. I'm gonna go f of x minus g of x. What's f of x? Negative three x plus four. Minus, what's g of x, x squared, plus 4x, plus 1. Don't forget, now we're subtracting this. We're going to have to distribute that negative sign to all of those. Don't forget to do that. And this is then equal to negative 3x plus 4, minus x squared, minus 4x, minus 1. Combine like terms, negative 3x minus 4x, could be negative 7x. Negative x squared minus 7x, 4 minus 1, plus 3. Plugging in negative three there. Negative, negative three squared, minus seven, negative three, plus three. So many threes. Negative three squared gives me nine. We saw that negative out front, so it's negative nine. Negative seven times negative three. How about 21? Plus three. Negative nine plus 21 plus three. What does that give me? Fifteen? Yeah? Everyone agrees fifteen? Okay, cool. You get fifteen. If we were to do it the other way, if we were just to do f of negative three minus g of negative three, what would we get? We know f of negative three is thirteen minus g of negative three, which is negative two. Oh, would you look at that? We got 15. I think that'll work for you to shave. All right. Is everyone okay on this? I'm doing well. I think we won't work left. We're not All right. Now we want F times G of X. So this is really f of x times g of x. What was f of x again? Like negative three x plus four. 
times x squared plus 4x plus 1. Cool. All right, now we have to multiply this. Two different ways to do it. Number one, you can just distribute. You can distribute negative 3x to all three of these terms. And then distribute four to all three of those terms, combine the term. Or you can do the little area box method. Um, I like just distributing it out. If you want to use the box, go for the box. I'll set up the box and we can solve it. Sorry for all the box people out there. But to set that up, it would look like this. I'm gonna have negative three X plus four right here x squared plus 4x plus 1. I like to write the, the signs of each one. That way I know if it's positive or negative and it's time to uh, Actually, I'll just do it this way. Sorry there. Now, just kind of find the area for each little box. 3x times x squared is going to give me negative 3x cubed. Negative 3x times 4x is minus 12x squared. Negative 3x times 1. Negative 3x. 4 times x squared. 4x squared, 4 times 4x, 16x. What's 4 times 1? Now you add the diagonals, or you can just write out all the terms and combine that terms from it. I don't know. You can either say, I know these both are x squared. I know those are both x's. I'm going to add those and combine them right away. You know, all right, you can also just write 3x cubed minus 12x squared plus 4x squared. Minus 3x plus 16x plus 4. And then combine that terms from there. Negative 3x cubed, negative 12x squared plus 4x squared is minus 8x squared. Negative 3x plus 16x is plus 13x plus 4. It may or may not ask you to find f times g of x to find this, and then go ahead and find f of negative 3 or f times g. Of negative three. All right? So this part may not be this. It could be, you know, just be part of f times g of negative three. To ask you to do that, you already found what f times g of x is. And then just plug in negative three to that. And you've done it. Uh, a lot of times these exams, they set you up to kind of just use what you used beforehand. Just kind of be aware of that. I'm going to erase this because I kind of need room for a G of F. Is that okay? Don't want to write with this. <laughs> I'll leave some box out. Now we want G of F and X. We're not multiplying them, right? It has a little open dot. So this, I like to just rewrite it as G of F of X. I know that then I'm going to be substituting on my F function into G. So this is really G. I know f of x is equal to negative three x plus four, and that becomes my input. So now for every x term in G, I'm putting negative three x. So now this becomes negative three x plus four squared plus four times negative three x plus four plus one. And remember, the direction said simplify. I'm gonna leave that at the end. A little exercise for you, a little practice for you. Um, what you want to do, right? You're going to want to foil this out. You're going to want to distribute that, combine all those like terms. Go. I'll leave that up to you. I'll try to do that later tonight or tomorrow. Congrats. Sound good? Cool. All right. If it says g of f of negative 3, what would you do? Right? Simplify that, plug in negative 3 to that, g of f of negative. Or you can find f of negative three, plug that number in the g of g times. Yeah, that would be good. All right, moving on. Is a solution setup problem. Anyone's favorite? Um, I kind of went back over kind of exams and 
went over the topics and found options that people didn't like or kind of people some people struggled with. Um, let's try to get that review. Figured we go over what people didn't do too hot with. Um, I think it was obviously we'll go over some stuff that people did well, but I kind of a little bit more beneficial to kind of go over what everyone struggled with rather than what everyone did well with. Kind of easy for us. So. All right, how many gallons of a 40% alcohol solution in a 60% alcohol solution must be mixed to get 12 gallons of a 45% alcohol solution? We're just going to set this up. We're not going to solve this. We're just going to try to create that system of equations to solve this. This is where I like to use the table. All right, the first kind of column is just going to be the type. What types of solutions are we looking Well, I got a 40%. I got a 60%. All right. And then final, I want a 45. That's my last little row. Next one. Quantity, right? Quantity, you can literally just put how much? Question mark. We're in gallons this one, right? So, well, that's what we're trying to find, right? We don't know how much of this, so that's going to be one variable. We don't know how much of this that we want. That's going to be another variable. We know we want to end with 12. So that's going to be end one. 12. Okay. Next up, this is going to be back to like percent of the liquid, right? That was simple percent. Or the actual, I guess you could say value. That might be a better word. Basically, with these percents, 40%, that's 0.4, right? Now, we just want to write it as percent. 60%, that value is 0.6. 45%, that's just 0.45. All right, basically, then taking those percents, converting them into decimals and numbers that we can actually work. And then down here, this is just kind of like, right? In order to get this row, what do we need to do? Multiply these first two. Equal that. 0.4 times x. Well, that's just 0.4x. Y times 0.6. That's just 0.6y. Can someone do 12 times 0.45? 5.4. All right. All right. Multiply this equals that. Multiply this equals that. Multiply this equals that. Now, take this row and take your last row. X plus y is going to equal 12. That is my first equation. I know I need x gallons of the 40%, y gallons of the 60% to get 12 gallons of the 45%, right? That's kind of what we're solving for, right? How much of each solution that we need. And then 0.4x plus 0.6y, it's going to equal 5.4, right? Then that kind of dives more deeper into, you know, which the kind of concentrations of the solution how much are we going to like to make sure it kind of levels out and is what we need. This is all we want. That's all we need. That's all the question asks. It's set up there. Um, yeah. Maybe. Well, how do, you, how do we solve that? System of equations, right? System of equations, either substitution, elimination, or graphing. Whichever one you want to do. Let's specify it. Um, for this one, it might, it shouldn't specify, it should just, if it's how to solve it, solve it however you want, this. but it might just ask me to set it up as well. Good on this Now we're going to solve the following equation. We're going to solve all of these. Uh, let's see, part A will be a 15z minus 20x minus 12 so with a negative 2 times 3x plus 11 minus 15z. Here, let's go through and start doing you know, all the operations, combining like terms, see what we can do. 15z minus 20x minus 12. I'm going to distribute this negative 2 first. We have minus 6x, minus 22, minus 15z. All 
Now just start combining any like terms that we can, right? 15 T, I'm actually just gonna move everything to the other side. I'm gonna add six X plus 22 plus 15 T. Plus six X plus 22 plus 15 Z. So all of this side's done. So now I have 15 Z minus 20 X minus 12 plus six X plus 22 plus 15 Z. It's all equal to zero. Combining that terms, I have 15 Z plus 15 Z gives me 30 Z. Negative 20 X. Plus 6x gives me minus, what is that, 14x? Negative 12 plus 20q plus 22 gives me positive 10 equals 0. Uh, we can't do anything more beyond that. Uh, can we leave it So good. Now I'm just trying to get y'all, uh, it's been a while since you've seen sort of this problem like this. I'm just different variables, distributing stuff in, moving stuff around, combining that terms. To kind of get y'all to practice that. 19a minus 19 divided by 19 is equal to a over 3. What I recognize so this is 19a minus 19 all over 19. 19 on the top and bottom. Okay. I'm going to pull out a 19 from the numerator to get 19, is that a minus 1? Over 19 is equal to a over 3. I have a 19 on the top, I have a 19 on the bottom. It's gone. Here it is. Right. That's only if it is the same term. If it is a different term, just don't cancel it out. That makes no sense. Okay. So now, left on the left side, we get a minus 1 equal to a over 3. What I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply by 3 equals that. Right? I'm going to multiply this by 3, but then I have to multiply this entire side. By three. So then I have 3a minus 3 is equal to a. I'm going to subtract a. 2a minus 3 is equal to 0. And then I add 3 to both sides. 2a is equal to 3. Divide by 2. a is equal to 3 halves. And we are done. Um, there may be a more direct route, route, however you want to say it, to get to here. Doesn't matter how you get there. Don't get there. Um, it's just says simplify and solve. So as long as you simplify and solve, you're good to go. Questions on this one? Anyone else tired? Well, sir. X plus four, that quantity squared, minus six plus 19, or sorry, minus six equal 19. I recognize that this whole term with this X is a square term. I want to get that by itself. The reason I want to get that by itself is because I want to take the square root. So I'm going to add six to both sides. And so I get x plus four squared is then equal to 25. Now I have the square root on the left side by itself. Get rid of the square. Take the square root. Square root of the left side. Square root of the right side. What you do one side, you got to do the other side. So now we have x plus 4 on the left side is equal to, what's the square root of 25? Plus or minus. Don't forget, plus or minus 5. Right? When you're taking the square root, plus or minus 5. The only time you're going to take the square root and not take the negative is if it's an actual applied problem. Say we were talking about moose, right? And we found the moose population. Could the moose population be like negative 5? That makes sense. If we're trying to find the length, can we get a negative length? No, right? A lot of the times, these sort of problems come up in those application problems. Um, oh, hold on. Oh, my battery is running low. Oh, that's fun. Um, that's exciting. Oh, I'm at 6%. Hold on. That wouldn't be good. All right.
Oh, no, we're going to have to move this. Um, okay. Can you also give me uh, the boarding game? Like, yeah, that's yeah. fine. Oh, thanks. Um, anyways, back to my little spiel. Return to square root of 25. It's going to be plus or minus 5, right? The only time you're not going to take that negative is when you're talking about like distance, right? Can you have a negative 5 length? No, just doesn't make sense. So let me have that. There that. But here we're solving, so we're going to take plus or minus. And so now here, I subtract 4, right? So we're going to get x by itself. I'm going to subtract by 4. So we get x is equal to plus or minus 5 minus 4. What's this plus or minus? I'm going to create two equations, right? We need one with positive 5, one with negative 5. So I'm going to separate this into two. We get x is equal to 5 times 4, right? We take that plus 5. We also get x is equal to negative 5. x is equal to 1. x is equal to negative 9. Done, right? We take 1, take that positive 5, we take that negative 5, we create those two equations. We subtract 4 from both of those, right? Just how when we kind of uh, that factor a uh, polynomial, we have those two factors, we split it into the two equations. Same sort of concept right there, but now we're some plus or minus. Yeah. All right. Any questions on that one? Is that the case? Yeah. All right. We're almost done, I promise. All right. This one, um, no one likes. So I put it in. Uh, we have x minus 4 times the square root of x plus 4 equals 0. This means we are going to use substitution, right? We see these variables and we're like, this does not look normal. This does not look like what we're used to. So we're going to use substitution. Both of these are u. I'm going to use u. Some people said they like me to use u, so why? So what I'm going to do? u. What do I set equal to? The middle variable term, which is? Square root of x, right? Take this term. Square root of x, then equal to n. Why do you do that? Well, when you square it, it's a problem. Right? You square it, then equal to the square root of x squared. What's the square root of x squared? It's just that, right? The square root and the square, right? Those cancel out. U squared is equal to x. That matches that front term, and that's what we want, right? Get now x. That becomes u squared minus 4. Well, we said square root of x, and there's u. That's u plus 4 equals 0. Now this looks a little bit more what we like, what we're comfortable with, what we've seen before. Just back to this. Well, two terms multiply the positive 4 and add to negative 4. Negative 2, negative 2, sure, right? Negative 2 times negative 2, positive 4, sure. What's a negative 2 plus negative 2? Negative 2. Perfect. All right? So we get u minus 2. u minus 2 equals 0. Okay? Right? Now, split it into u minus 2 is equal to 0. u minus 2 is equal to 0. u is equal to 2. u is equal to 2. Are we done there? Right? We started in terms of x, we need to finish in terms of x. u is equal to square root of x. Square root of x equals 2. Square root of x equals 2. Um, typically, they will not be the same here. They'll be two different ones. Um, this is what we got here. So we're doing it. Get rid of the square root. How do we do that? The square. Square both sides. Right? Square that side. Square that side. So x is equal to 4. And we're done there, right? Now we have it back in terms of x, which is what we started with, what we want, x equal 4. Usually, if it'll be two different numbers, it will not be the same number, but here we have the same number. So what can you do? Right? 
Questions on that one? We're good? Like when you get used for what? Like a number? Um, yeah. Yes, we could also use what? Very formal word. Good. Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, it might get messy though. It might get messy, but you can. Um, when you set the due date for you, what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. If you don't see the two kind of factors that it factored into right away, um, yeah, you can use a uh, quadratic formula. Sometimes you have to use the AC method too. Um, if that's ones, if it's like a two or three out in front of that u squared term, uh, this time we left out in science. But yeah, you can use any of those techniques. All right, last question. I'm sorry, pick eight, eight. Given the function x squared minus 36. We're going to find the axis of symmetry. We're going to find the vertex. We're going to find the x-intercepts. We're going to find the y-intercept. And then we're going to graph. Um, so, yeah. Two different ways to go about this. The first way, you can convert this to vertex form. To do that, right, we're going to complete the square, do all that sort of stuff. We don't have to do that here. Um, a different way to go about it, axis of symmetry. X is equal. And you'd be able to it. What is my B in X squared minus 36? Zero, right? There's no X term. There's no middle term. There's nothing there. It's zero. Negative zero to what's my A term? One. Does that matter? No. Zero divided by anything is just zero. So my axis of symmetry here is just X equals zero. So do you know this little formula right here? It's kind of uh, replaces converting to vertex form. That's saying, that's not saying, don't know how to convert to vertex form. Still potential to be on the exam, right? Still want to complete the square, still want to know how to do that. Look at exam four review for that. Um, still in the Yes. Yeah, right? Because if you want to find the box, you complete the square, right? It's negative B over 2A squared. And go back to that true or false. Right. What do the axis of symmetry and vertex have in common? Same x value, right? The vertex is the same as this. So if my x up here is 0, then x in my vertex will be 0. If my x up here, if my axis of symmetry is 1, the x in my vertex will be 1. And same thing. If we find the vertex, we know the axis of symmetry. Those x values will be the same. So if we have x value and we have a function, can we find y value? Just plug it in, right? Just find that from zero. That's going to give me zero squared minus 36. That's negative 36. That's your vertex. Um, if it's zero. Yeah, but it's a vertex. It's just going to be zero. For yeah, if it's vertex form, it's same. Yes, right. Vertex form to HK. Right. Uh, all right. Now we have the axis symmetry. We have the vertex. Now we need to find the x-intercept. How do we find the x-intercept? We set y equals zero and solve for x. Right. Set y equal to zero. All right. So zero equal to x squared. Minus 36. Luckily, this one, a little bit easier to factor, right? One way we factor, we can recognize this is a difference of squares, right? X squared minus 6 times 6, which is 6 squared, right? So that we get x plus 6, x minus 6. That's one way to do it. Or you can just solve for x directly here. I'm going to add 36 to both sides. I'm going to get 36 is equal to x squared. How do I get x by itself? Take the square root. So then I get x is equal to, what is the square root of 36? Plus or minus six. So my x-intercepts are now, you can write it as x equals six, x equals negative six. You can also write it as negative six comma zero, six comma zero. I'm gonna write it as negative six zero and six zero because I'm going to graph it. 
right? I'm going to write it in that ordered pair, in that ordered pair, to know that I will be graphing this. Long term, you see it then follow my graphing. We just always write it in that in that form now rather than later. Right? Save yourself a couple, maybe like a couple seconds that you're saving, but it's not the second point. Why intercept? How do we solve the y intercept? So x equals zero, right? We've set x, well, then we already set x equals zero up here. What do we get? 36, right? So zero comma negative 36. So that's actually our y-intercept too, right? So our vertex and our y-intercept turn out to be the same here. Um, it's not always going to be that way. It's how it worked out here. So as long as you know the process, set x equals zero, solve for y. Good there, we already did that up here. Why do it twice? So now I'm gonna list these points kind of off to the side. Well, we have x equals zero. For our axis of symmetry, we have 0, negative 36. We have negative 6, 0. We also have 6, 0. We would have 0, 36. You have that line except right here. But it's the same exact, so. But just kind of, you know, for study, just know the line except right that idea. That's not what we want to grab. We want to clearly have five points labeled. All right, it's clearly label five points in the axis of symmetry. I'm going to start with the axis of symmetry. x equals zero. That's just the y axis. All right, I'm going to start with here. All right, check that. Check that point off. We're done. Second one, zero, negative 36. Oh, gosh. That's, uh, that's pretty far down. Dude. Um. It's, it's going to be like right here. I don't have a lot of board space up here. Let's just say that's 0, negative 36, all right? Um, on the exam or anything, it'll actually give you a graph and the points um, where it all fits. Um, it's not going to give you a 10 by 10 uh, coordinate plane and ask you to graph 0, negative 36. That's all me. All right, check that one off. Next one is negative 6, 0. Well, I can graph that. That's on mine. Check it out. Six zero. Check it out. We would then graph our y intercept here too. Technically, it's already zero to thirty six, but we'd go back there. That's three points. All right. You would need five points. Your y intercept helps you find that second point. Um, obviously, I can't show that here. So. But once you find the fifth point, you can just connect all the dots. Draw, oh, that works. Draw your little graph, your check off. You would find that second point. Say we have a point, uh, let's say we have a point on uh, what, right here? Uh, negative six comma five. All right, using axis of symmetry, we know this is six points to the left. At that same y value, you just go six points to the right. And it would actually go through right there. All right. Just get that near point on the other side, right? At that same y value, right? Sorry, that's not six points at all. That's eight. Oh, okay. Whatever. You all get what I'm saying, right? Axis of symmetry is a mirror image. Say this point six spots, it's not really six. Six points left, you then go six points right at the same y value. Say this is four points left, four points right at the same y value, right? Five points to the right, five points to the left at the same y value. That's how the axis of symmetry works. That's how you find that fifth point. Usually, if the same as the y-intercept, right? It's that mirror image of the y-intercept. Here, obviously, it's the same. That's the last question, fine. Um, 12 minutes before eight, I feel like that's pretty good. Um, yeah. Questions, comments, concerns? 
How did you use that again? Just like the A part of it? The A of the X A given vertex one? Yeah, so basically, say we have f of x is equal to, say, 2x minus 3 squared plus 8. Right, this means stretching by 2. So you're going to take your y values, multiply by 2. So for this case, if we knew we were stretching this graph up by 2, take these y values, take 5, multiply by 2. That then becomes negative 6, 10. Right, this would then be six ten. Um, make sense? Yeah, just take that. If it's that stretch, right? If it's compression, right? If it's a fraction, if it's that zero between that zero and one term, like one fifth or a one half, same process. Just multiply those y values by one and do those transformations left there. So good. Is that actually like when there is a gradient there? I believe you feel like you want to add subtract with like for the vertex. Like, yes. just basically convert it. I just think that that vaguely thing with the box is important. You want to convert the vertex one? Yeah. Okay. Just like, what's like the, if you go through like the steps again, like I know the part of the vertex, so make sure like you subtract the. I don't think one more time that. All right, so we have, all right, so we're going to convert to vertex form from fx is equal to x squared minus 36. Well, we already completed squared. I'm going to write steps. Step one, complete squared. Actually, we can pull all different things. Thank you, Trap, Mr. Caldwell. <laughs> Um, where is it? All right. All right, so we want to convert this to vertex form, right? Step one, what we want to do is, all right, so we have f of x is equal to negative 2x squared minus 4x plus 2. I'm just going to set equal to zero and have negative 2x squared minus 4x plus two. Sound good? What I want to do next, I'm just going to move this negative two to the other side. I'm also going to set it equal to zero on this side. I don't like doing it this way. I like having zero on the right side. It doesn't matter if you have one left or right. I just like it on the right. Well, we're you know, really I'm going to subtract two to both sides. I'm going to get negative two x squared minus four x, right? I'm going to save that box. I know we're going to be adding box minus two plus that box. And then, you do the and then what's the box equal? Three, two. Negative B, well, that's just going to give me four, right? Over two times negative two squared. That's four divided by negative four. That's negative one squared. Gives me positive one. So I'm adding one to both sides. All right? Sorry, hold on. Now take it back. You start. That's going to stay the same somehow. If you click square, we need x squared, just a one out in front. You can't have any two out in front. I always jump the gun on that. So, in order to do that, we divide everything by this negative two. So, we get x squared plus 2x minus one to zero. Again, moving one to both sides. x squared plus 2x plus that box. Is that equal to one? Plus that box. Now, using this. Negative b over 2a. Negative 2 divided by 1 squared. Sorry, divided by 2. Negative 1 squared is equal to 1. We're still adding 1 on both sides, which is x squared plus 2x plus 1 is equal to 2. Back to the left side. What two numbers multiply 1 and add 2? x plus 1. You should get the same factor. It should be x plus 1 times x plus 1 is equal to 2. Call it completing the square because you should have a square term or square factor on the left side. Rewriting the same term. X plus one squared is equal to two. Move the two to the other side. We need it in vertex form. Moving two to the other side. X plus one squared minus two is equal to zero. 
We still need that A out front. Look back at the original problem. What is my A term in the original problem? Negative 2. Just plug that in. Negative 2. X plus 1 squared minus 2 is equal to 0. What is my vertex with my axis of symmetry? Vertex. Negative 1, negative 2. What's my axis of symmetry? Keep it that same. And there you go. That's how you do that. Questions, comments, concerns on that? Oh, great. Um, recording.